Hey, what's up, everybody? It's GP13 here. This is for you, round one of this podcast for me and Eric. This is uh, round two after I uh, couldn't get the recording over the finish line, got corrupted. But I'm welcoming to the show really one of the the most successful people of the the poker boom. If you you may know him as Sheets, if you're a poker player, you may know him as Eric Haber, if you're a DFS player. Uh, but yeah, Eric, welcome to the show. I'm pumped to have you. Thank you very much. You know, it's uh, it's interesting. The, the Sheets moniker has has has, uh, has flourished through the years. Uh, people still call me Sheets, and the, the, the nickname has nothing to do with any of it. it. Has literally nothing to do with with poker or anything. The, the nickname actually comes from horse race. Um, I've been doing horse racing, including like pick six, pick six syndicates, and all kinds of stuff forever. And I use a data source called the Sheets. Um, Interesting. And going back to when I was really, really young, people would see me walking around with this, these sets of sheets, and people would say, "Hey, Sheets." So that that nickname <laughs> like pre predated poker by at least fifteen years. So wow, it's uh yeah. So uh, that's that's uh, that's where that. Came. It definitely stuck in the poker world. Like I we I didn't you know I I, I wasn't as. Uh, I don't think I was as successful enough to to run your circles as much back at the end of the boom. I kind of came around, but like certainly everybody knew backs and sheets. Uh, you know, you guys ran a, I guess the most successful stable and probably the first one to scale. But um, yeah, if you don't mind walking, a lot of people here might have gotten into you know advantage play recently through you know online legalization of online sports books. It might be like two to three years in the space. If you want to just walk people through kind of your intro into the space and how how you came up through horse racing, poker, now you know DFS and betting. Oh wow! Okay, so um, so advantage advantage gambling that's 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 code now for for being good. Like what, what being is good what? at gambling? Yeah, yeah being well, good. She, it's like uh, if you think about it, how do you? Because you know, I can't. A lot of us came from poker too. Yeah. And you know, there's people who sports betting came from blackjack. So it's not necessarily the same career, but I also don't see it as like two separate careers. So I just like to now yeah. call it AP because like there's been so many oh. booms, right? Where right. like you're like, oh, now we got to focus on DFS. Oh, DFS yeah. is dead. Now we got a sports bet, you know? So, so again, so going all the way back, you know, I, uh, I mean, I've done horse racing kind of my my whole life you know going all the way back to when i was really really young and then when i got into the sheets this was kind of more when i was in uh in college and going into into law school actually and uh i was really you know made a good amount of money doing that in both college more in law school actually um uh i can't take this um but uh and, and then I was, all the while, I was also doing trading of my own stock account. I was managing family money. So it was, I was always involved in that, that type of thing. And then after law school, actually, I moved out to California and I got even more into the horse racing piece. I, I, my roommate was, 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 was an expert horse handicapper and we did pick sixes. We did pretty much everything. Like five days a week, we would go to Santa Anita or Hollywood or whatever. And then the day that we were off, we would fly to I'd fly to Vegas the one day that California was off and bet like every other track in the country, you know. And, and so I got involved in doing that. And then there was a little bit of a break, you know, when I uh, I, I studied for the bar when I moved back to New York. I still did the the, the sheets on the side, and I also did, um, you know, the, I always did the did the stock market stuff. And then I got into First, I got into chess. I got really into chess back when I was uh, just uh, started to teach the bar exam for a living. And chess naturally turned into backgammon. And that's where I got really, really into it. You know, I was kind of a tournament backgammon player. Where I learned from scratch. And that's where I met Phil Lack and all, all of the backgammon guys. Okay. And Gus Hansen or? Yep. 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 All these, all, the, all those guys I knew back from the New York, you know, backgammon scene. And so then. Slowly but surely, all the backgammon guys, we can mention they all go from here to here to here, right? So all the backgammon guys just started to play poker, okay? And that all started with when Antonio won the uh, won the WPT event, like way back, way back when. Um, uh, Phil Phil decided he was going to play poker. And my friend Elon Schwartz, uh, he was a guy I knew from chess. And he said, dude, you know, you really got to get into, you got to get really into poker. 
And I was one who literally didn't know the rules of like no limit holder, like at all. I, I knew what beat what from in poker in general, but I literally didn't know the rules. And he said to me, dude, why don't you just, you know, I've been going to this tournament at the PlayStation in New York. That was like kind of an underground kind of like tournament place in New York. And I've been, I've been basically winning every week, you know, obviously he wasn't winning every week, but that's what he said, right? So I'm winning every week. You should go check it. You'd be really, really good at it. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go. Maybe I'll go and watch. He's like, F that. You know, you don't want to come and watch. Why don't you come and play? I'm like, dude, I don't know how to play. He's like, just learn the rules. It's 50 dollars, whatever it is. And then, so he said to me something. I'll never forget. He said, dude, listen, for $50, you get 300 in chips. And so I said, Oh my God, how can I pass that up? How do you get hours, 300 in chips? I mean, that's got what is some like, like beginners, like discount bonus or something like that, right? I, so I, so I get there, I literally bought $50 and I read the rules and I was just kind of figuring it out, right? So we're playing, we're playing, we're playing. And then after about an hour or two, they said, okay, it's uh, time for the rebuys. And I'm like, the what? Right? And, and Elon says, so are you going to, uh, you going to rebuy? And I was embarrassed to say that I only brought fifty dollars. You know, I didn't want to like, say that yeah, I didn't know no, what to do. So I said, "No, no, I'm good. I got, I got plenty, right?" And he says, "Well, dude, if you don't, if you don't rebuy for more chips, you might only have to be able to play with like a pocket pair." Good thing I didn't know what that term meant. Okay, <laughs> don't worry, I'm good. You know, whatever. <laughs> so we we played and we played. And I sort of kind of were figuring it out along the way. And then after another couple of hours, I said, "Okay, let's uh, let's count the chips." I'm like, "What's going on?" And they said, "Well, you're at the final table." I'm like, "I am." So like, yeah, I'm like, is that good, right? So they started like, and back then everybody kind of always chopped when they made the final table. So they they calculated it out, they figured it out. I I cashed for like four hundred ninety eight dollars, and the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> um, uh, I I totally got into it like right from there, right from the beginning, and got really into learning. I gave up back, gave up everything, and this became like my new passion. And this is now back in what, 2004, 2005, you know, Moneymaker had just won the year before. Raymer had just actually just won 2004. And so I just kind of went off on it and got really into playing. Um, I played all the time on party poker and poker stars. And back in those days, paradise poker, I was, you know, 20 tabling MTTs like, like every day that I could. And I was learning at, at a stage where you think of like all these businesses where literally nobody knew anything. You know, all, all people knew was what they saw on TV, you know, maybe what they read in, in Brunson Doyle's book or whatever, but they never actually did work on the math, you know, and certainly on the all in stuff and whatever. And so all at the time, you know, I met up with these guys that originally were on TV. Um, they used to call themselves the crew. And that was Dutch Boyd, uh, Brett uh, uh, Gank Jungblood and, um, and Scotty Fishman. And through this story that's been pretty well documented. Um, at this point, they needed like backing in some tournament and Phil Lack introduced me to them. And I said, OK, it's this is really cool. You have these three young guys who are trying to take over the poker world, which is dominated by old people, you know, whatever it is. I'm kind of into it, you know, because listen, I grew up like having to try to explain to people how gambling is not really, you know, gambling is not gambling. If you're doing it for advantage, like you're saying, and you've had the same discussion with your family over the years. And so I said, OK, let's try it. So as I'm learning how to play. I'm starting to stake these guys and these guys sort of taught me how to play. They taught me like all in stuff before anybody knew to go all in, you know? So all this kind of happened at the same time. I got really, really good at one time. I was, I was ranked number two uh, in online poker back in, back in the day. Right. Um, and a lot of people were playing. And at the same time I was staking these guys and they were making a decent amount of money. So like anything else, I, I figured I'm, I wonder if this whole thing could even scale because I'm now playing poker. I'm playing 20 tournaments, right? And what's better than me playing 20 tournaments? Well, me playing 2,000 tournaments, right? I can only play a certain amount of, at a time. So if I can get, you know, 50 Eric's, you know, to play at the same time, that's even better. Um, even more to the point, even if I can get 50 guys that weren't quite Eric's, but just like better than, than, than you know, you needed to be. That's like really cool. That's like the ultimate business model, right? To to not be doing anything and other people doing stuff for you and making money. So I I start I, I took on a, a partner Cliff, uh, you know Johnny Bax. Joseph, he he was from my industry and I kind of taught him how to play. Like he was the one that he said, "Dude, you're you're making money playing poker." So I taught him how to play. And then he was watching me stake these people. He's like, "Can I get in on this?" So anyway, so we built this in this stable of players um, that we had playing online 
like every single day. So we had, you know, somewhere between 40 and like 60, you know, batches and sheets all playing at the same time online. And we turned into a whole thing. We had an accounting system. We had a whole, we had a whole thing. And you think about this is at a time where you didn't need to be that great to win. You know, like, so, so people were always asking me, are your guys good? I'm like, forget good. My guys are good enough, you know? And that's, that's a really big difference, you know? So, so, so that turned into like live stuff. And that was actually the interesting thing because back in those days, all the people wanted to do was play, was play live. Okay. They want to play the big live tournaments. Okay. Because that's where all the huge payouts were, whatever. And back then the thought was that the live part was harder. Okay. You can imagine this, right? You can't even imagine that being the case. But back then the, the live part was harder because you had to play against guys like Phil Helmy. For, for example, right? <laughs> no like, comment. You had to play well. You had to play against guys like PJ Cloutier. Like you had to play against guys like I'm just throwing names out there. Yeah. I think you get the point, right? And because these guys had all these reputations, so the, it was weird. They were like, "Well, we really want to play live." So we were like, "You know what? You put in the time online. The easier tournaments, right? We would then let you play the tougher tournaments, like the World Series of Poker main event, right? And this is this is really what we thought at the time that the live was harder. So this was kind of like the thing. And, what was cool about it for us was that this is where all the volume was kind of online. So you got all that good stuff that you probably talk about in half your podcast about sample size and 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 and, and spreading out variance over 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 that type of, of of scale. And so then, so it was beautiful. We would be making our money online, and then the weirdest thing happened is the, the live tournaments that we were sending them to. Pretty quickly, we figured out we're not was was not the hard ones. <laughs> those those were the ones like we like people that really studied online back in those days. They became better than all those live pros in about six months. Okay, because think about it. Like if you're if you're it makes sense. I mean, if you're like a live pro, even with twenty years of experience, I can get twenty years of experience in probably four months you know, a volume online as far as this number of hands played, right? And you get feedback and like all that. So so one thing led to another. So we we're doing online and we we're doing live and we just kind of just cleaned up. <laughs> it's like we, you know, all the results are kind of well documented. We had people win the main event. Uh, we had some, we had one guy win the main event. That same year that we had one guy win the main event, we, believe it or not, this is kind of ridiculous. We had actually three guys at the final two tables, which, which nobody. That's crazy. Right? And that's like the, the odds of that is literally zero. Right. Um, but, you know, we ran, we ran hot. <laughs> we ran hot on the, and when I say we run hot, yes, we, we had guys that over the long run were going to be huge edge, you know, have huge edge in the main event. The problem is, is that, you know, we rated to have someone win the main event sometime in the you know next 900 years, you know, but we don't, <laughs> we don't know where on that distribution curve it's going to actually. So we ran hot as far as I concerned. Di- what I call distribution risk, right? Our guys happen to get there before our grandchildren died of old age, you know, and that's just kind of the way, kind of the way it goes. So that was, um, that was a great time. Poker then kind of, you know, just fizzled a little bit. And when, when poker fizzled, that's actually an interesting bit of luck because when poker became sort of illegal or whatever, call it whatever it is, when Black Friday happened in 2012, you really couldn't play online anymore. It was already, at a point where our guys weren't really doing that well. I mean, the game had already started to catch up in 2012 so that what's good enough is not, is not good enough anymore, you know? So, so we almost got kind of bailed out a lose my part, almost kind of got bailed out a little bit um, with black Friday, because I don't know how we would have done um, if we continue to scale and not be quite as discerning about, you know, about who we took and whatever it was. So uh, so Cliff and I, we stopped doing stuff together. Um, and then I kind of just got out of the poker backing. I mean, I got in, I have a couple of people, whatever, but nothing really. And then I kind of focused my other stuff. I always, I always had my hedge fund. That was always my, 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 my main thing, but then I needed something to occupy my, you know, my passion space, you know, in my brain. And I did like AAU basketball for my son. Like when I was coaching him. I, I recorded everything. I did full analytics for like all the bat. All yeah. the I like literally like, seven, you can't take those shots from the top of the key anymore, Steve. 700, 700 hours of footage. Dude, I had sixth graders 
like competing for who had a hot, better, effective field goal percentage. Like I remember at sixth grade, like eighth graders, they would say they would when 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 other teams would take a shot from the top of the key, they would yell from the bench, "Bad two. because I would train them that that was a bad two. You know, and and, and so that was all. I love that. Yeah, it was awesome. That was a lot of fun. And then uh, in 2017, I got into DFS, and that was just kind of from. Uh, you know, I, I was still on two plus two poker at the time and, uh, you know, the, the forum site. And there was this, this, this contest that they were running that were saying, you know, uh, uh, one of one, one lineup in football, 17 weeks in a row, uh, you, you know, so it was $1,700 buy-in. So that's why it was 17, you know, times a hundred. That's how they put it together. And I said, you know what, everybody's playing DFS. I've heard about it. I don't know anything about it, but let me try to figure out how to play. And try to, so I reached out to a kid, a kid, uh, named Bobby Firestone, who used to be a poker player back in the day. He played as Bobby Bobby Fi, really, really good player. Um, I did some business with him. We didn't, I never staked him, but whatever. But he was uh, one of the head uh, instructors for Roto Grinders back at the time. He did all kinds of great content, listening to his stuff. And uh, I say, hey, can you? He's like, Sheesh, what's going on? I'm like, can you teach me how to play uh, uh, DFS? He's like, sure, no problem. I said, but I, I have to pay you. you can't. He's like, no, no, forget them. No, because if I don't pay you, it's not going to work. You know, like, I need you to. So I paid him to teach me how to play. And, he, you know, and I, I like anything else. I was a pretty quick study. And what was neat about DFS is it really resembled my hedge fund. Okay. It was all about portfolio management. And, and, and if you want to play like, you know, big high stakes, you know, big GPPs with like thousands of people in it, you have to know the difference between, for example, a company and a stock. Like you need to know the difference between a player and a DFS player, for example. You also need to know the difference between being able to buy 10 stocks and buying 10 stocks that work well together, you know what I mean? And, and make sure they correlate properly with one another. Same thing with DFS. You know, you want you don't want to just pick 10 good players. They have to work well together. And then over a portfolio to be able to find different lineups that work well together or whatever. So that that's why DFS was was uh, was was appealing to me. And then just like I did with poker, uh, you know, back in poker, I, I ran training sites all the time. Uh, one of the first training sites. So I decided to get into DFS content. So I'm doing that with Bobby right now. We have a site called True DFS, which is which. Listen, I try to do all the fun stuff that I think other people aren't doing. And again, I don't make any money off it really, you know, because DFS content's a tough space. But I have I have a lot of fun doing it, and then it keeps me kind of keeps me young. So that that is the the, the long arduous, uh, I guess, gambling biography of me. Uh, as far as sports betting stuff, I'm just you know I I just don't have edge. So if I don't have an edge, I don't I don't. I just don't like doing it. I just never really like that. I do survivor pool stuff. That's that I do that every year. Um, cause that's, that's very skillful. Um, so I do that every year, but as far as the sports betting piece, I really, really never get into it. It's not, it's not particularly interesting to me. You know, uh, uh, I guess it, it, it would be if I had an edge, I suppose. Um, but it, that, that whole thing is, is not particularly interesting to me. And I always think about, you know, from a content perspective, whether you can do content, you know, re- related to sports betting, we can get into a little more of that. Um, I hated to like ramble like the whole thing when I just I guess people just need an intro of where I came from. No, I think it's good because also you know most people listening to this show weren't around pre Black Friday. Yeah, it's, it's, it's you know maybe they were. There, there's a lot of people who who played in the full tilt days who you know send me DMs or whatnot. But I think it's important because. I think one thing I wanted to ask you about was the difficulties of scaling a business in the gambling space. And, you know, that was something that you really crushed uh, during poker. Outside of, you know, Joe Cata winning and whatnot, it sounds like during the online days, you had a steady stream of, you know, volume. Like, A, like how much volume do you think you were doing? I'm, I'm, that's just curious, like a day of buy ins. It's and then, hard. Yeah. Oh, and then I was gonna say, you know, B, can you can you talk about the troubles of scaling in in AP and gambling today? Like, it seems like the financial markets are the only place. It's it's, it's really can. interesting because uh, we'll go back to poker, then we'll talk about the sports betting. So, so sure. with poker, it was weird because when people would ask me about whether I thought that backing people playing and then backing people in poker tournaments could scale. My answer was kind of the opposite. I 
my philosophy was that it, it must scale. In other words, like if I couldn't scale, you know, then it's then it's like then first of all, it's stupid, but but you had to scale to make it work because of the insane amount of variance involved in the way results distribute, you know? And, and what was cool about it is that there's just so many people in these tournaments that it made it really, really easy. Like I, I never got to the number of people where I had to worry about taking my own money, you know? Um, and I guess you could say that technically, you know, in that, that, that situation I brought up where the, you know, you had the, the main event, I had two, three people at the final two tables. I guess technically I screwed up, right? If you think about it, right? Because like, you really don't want to have- I trade, you know, I trade pieces with you. <laughs> mathematically, you screwed up, right? Sort of, you know what I mean? Um, but, Did but, you but, have so, a number, like a no, like a percent no. of field threshold? Well, that's the thing, you know, and, and I did like a full, I did an hour and a half on this with, with, with Berkey back like, like a year or so ago. He was asking me all these questions. And I tell everybody the truth is that we were, the, I was the first one really to do it. I was, I was making it up. I mean, like along the way, you know, I had literally no idea how many people I should take, no idea what type of volume we could play. I just figured, I just kind of figure it out kind of along the way. And I just kind of felt right. I would tell people literally play everything, whatever that meant, you know, and I had like, what's the most we had maybe 60 people playing online. And I just kind of had a sense that I would just kind of feel it if it was, if it was, if it was too much. And I just, and I guess there would have been signs, I guess, like I said, if they had like four people at like the same table or something like that, that's just kind of stupid, you know, because again, the way results distribute, it's like having dupes in DFS, you know, you don't, you don't really want that. Um, I, and, and as, I, and as far as like how many buy-ins to put in and how much to stay people, it really wasn't like that. I really just kind of made it up along the way. And, and, and when, when they say, well, I'm going to play the world series. I'm like, okay, uh, you should play, uh, I don't know. I imagine you should play the high uh, people with a lot of pays a lot of money. That isn't that much because you know, you the five K's probably those are the toughest. And that was kind of like my, my thought. And when I did all the math at the end, at the end of the whole thing, I did a lot of, a lot of like a lot of work on, on how we actually did or whatever. And keep in mind, like all the sample size issues that are involved in that type of analysis, those like three K's and five K's, those were just enormous losers. Okay, like really, those were the and and we knew that like pretty quickly. And but when what we ended up doing is instead of telling people they couldn't play them and getting everybody mad at us, we just kind of knew that they would want to play them. We just kind of almost wrote those off as almost like lost leaders. Like if we broke even in those, like it was then we were they were golden because then we would get them to play all the fifteen hundreds in the main event. You know what I mean? That's that's basically what we wanted was like the fifteen hundreds in the main event. Those five Ks. And like the 5k six maxes, I mean, you got to be really good. You know? and, we, and we don't want to, we don't want tournaments where you have to be like amazing. You know, I don't want to play with, with, with Christian Harder and like all these, these are names in the past, but like Christian Harder, all these, all these, all these guys, are awesome. all these guys are awesome. I want to play the 1500 where half the people are, half the people are kind of clueless. So um, those, those tournaments were, were, were train wrecks. Uh, look, looking, looking back. And the good thing is we did know, we did figure it out pretty quickly that those were train wrecks. But again, like we, we, we would let people play them anyway, because then they would play the other stuff for us. So this is to me, one of the biggest, so I, you know, being on sports betting Twitter and, and whatever, like previously, um, I see where I see people struggle with scale is exactly that. It's like this, emotional intelligence where like I'm aware I've friends with poker players. If you tell them you can't play five Ks, you can't play three Ks, they're going to freak out. They can lose. And what you're saying is you realize that about them. You say, I'm going to lose money in these for the greater good to keep my people happy. So they play 1.5 Ks. So they play millions. Um, That to me is the missing link because I feel like so much of gambling Twitter is like emotionally (laughs) Uh, low IQ and it bumps into that area where, you know, you don't have to be the best poker player in the world is what you're saying. Where you won, I feel like is that emotional aspect, that emotional, that EQ aspect where you just made way more money than probably some smart person who was, you know, unwilling to, to, 
work well with others. Well, we also, I mean, listen, I mean, that, that is a part of it. I and mean, you're man, you're, listen, you're managing poker players, but you are managing people, you know, and, 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 and you want to be able, it's not like I'm, I'm putting a bot in a tournament, you know, you put a bot in a tournament, you're getting the best, your best effort every single time because it's a bot, right? You're, you're putting a human being in a tournament. You're, you're just getting random. You're, you're getting some randomization, right? Of, of their effort. And the happier they are, the more motivated they are, the better, the, just the better, the closer they're going to get to what, to their, their top effort. And, you know, for example, they're, they're, and to know your people is really big. Like you have two different players. You have two guys that are $50,000 in makeup. Okay. For example, one of them will never play well again. Okay. They will be on tilt forever because they know that they have to make 50,000 to start getting paid. And the other one is so freaking psycho that they don't care. You know what I mean? And, and to be able to tell the difference is like a really, really big deal. And, and to be able to sense who's like over it, you know, like, and who's on tilt and who's whatever and, and making decisions like that, that a computer would never make. Okay. So let's say that there was a guy that we had that had $200,000 in makeup. Okay. In his head, I know that he had it in him to win it, 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 for his skill, right? And he has $200,000 in makeup, but I knew that he was completely dusted, okay? He was mentally destroyed. He either wasn't playing well or couldn't play well. And to make the decision to drop a guy like that, okay, with $200,000 in makeup, which I would get and for free. Wanna- Right. So right. just explain to the sports bettors why that's good for the backer. Right. right. So if I if I back someone, uh, tip, you know, all, all your all rules are different. Okay. But the standard thing was in a long term deal. If you know, I back someone and I didn't get a certain percentage of the profits. Okay. But once they went into makeup, let's say they lost fifty thousand dollars, they would have to make that up before they got paid. Okay. They wouldn't owe me the fifty thousand necessarily, but so it's not well alone, but those that money has to be made up before you get paid because you're getting a percentage of the profits, right? So what would happen is is that people would go into makeup, say fifty thousand dollars. I use that as an example, but it could have been much more through no other fault of just variance. I mean, and that just happens, you know. And so in in their life now, they now are no they know they're not getting paid like actual cash until they make $50,000. So you think about this in their head, boy, if it's a $30,000 for first place, even if I win, I'm not getting paid. Are they going to be motivated to play it? Well, these are tough, right? These are, these are tough, these are tough questions, right? So we, we came up with all kinds of different things to deal with that. You know, like we would say, we would do, we tried everything. I tried, you have know, like makeup forgiveness day sometimes, like, like some Wednesday where everything was really soft or something. I would say, you know what, you play full volume today, whatever you make today, you can get 50% regardless of your makeup, you know, try that. Mm-hmm. Like, well, what are, these, what, what are you going to do? Are these things try. Um, and I don't know what, what, what's going to work. You know, these, these, these are ideas. We ran like contests on the side where regardless of makeup, if you made the most for the team, then they got, we got like a, like a cash prize or something like that. Like just little things like that, to, that, to, that could, oops. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, hey, sorry, I think I lost you. Yeah, we're back. So, okay. So, so little things like that to keep to keep everybody motivated. And motivated again is is yes, you try to win the emotional IQ game because if you're emotionally in the right spot, then you're gonna come closer to to doing the right things and come closer to being good enough kind of to win. So all that kind of stuff we 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 tried. And 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 those are things that you don't think about. It's not just who, uh, I'm going to pick a couple of good poker players, and if they're good, they're going to win. You know, do, do you know other stuff that we did? So there was a guy who every time that he played for us, this is what would happen: he would win like a hundred thousand, whatever it is, and then he would be at some live tournament. He would go ballistic, and he would like dust off like five thousand of our money playing backer. Okay, literally steal our money. Okay, he would go like sometimes online. He would lie about his balances. He whatever rip us off cold for like 12,000. And then like after like a month or two or whatever it is, I'm like Cliff would be out of his mind. Okay. Like, like <laughs> and I would be too, whatever. Then he would come back and he would say, oh, yeah, any chance you can forgive me and have me play again? Me? I'm like, sure, no problem. And I would know 
that he was going to steal from me later. But it didn't matter. You know what I mean? Because because the cycle was not just he would steal. It was always, he would always win, but he just had this chip in his head. So I would almost kind of look at it like, in, from an accounting perspective, kind of like allowance for doubtful accounts. You know, yep. like if you would you do whatever and, and you know that there'd be some slippage. You would know that like, you know, listen, you're not exactly like, like backing angels, right? Um, and eventually, you know, the, it, would, it was just one of those things that was just part of against the losses. Could you model for that? No. But, and we have plenty of stories like that about people that are ripping us off. But, but these are, again, these are, these are, I, I don't know if I'd recommend thinking about things that way, but it's certainly not the worst idea in the world. You know, um, it's, 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 it's not just, it's not just about the EV. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. I mean, I, one of the best quotes I've ever seen on Twitter was from, uh, Matthew Trench, the guy, uh, he was like a, I think his old name was Massive Arbor or something. It, Matthew Tannehill, I, I, I'm, I'm fucking this up, but he said like, you're, you're going to get, you know, there's a number that you should get stiffed or you should get stolen from and it shouldn't be zero. Right. And I was like, that's exactly right. Because I don't know, like, I think any, like our stiff, like our getting stiff number is over is six figures for sure. Like I, we've gotten, you know, uh, definitely stiff for, you know, whatever. I, I don't know what it is, but it's in the six figures. And I think like everybody, you know, yours could even be much higher as a, as a backer. And like, I think most successful gamblers have gone stiff in that like six to seven figure range. And you just have to, if you let it like cripple you mentally you're not going to make it because part of being successful i think is like taking going out on a limb a little bit where like you will occasionally get stiff and that's okay right well well let me let me let me get back to scale for a minute because i wanted to get back yeah to yeah, yeah. To the sports betting part of it so i mean i know guys that run sports betting syndicates i know guys that that that, that put like just a ton of money into into sports betting you know, trying to make the 2% or whatever they can make, you know, over volume. And, and I was shocked to, to, to find out like five, 10 years ago that, that the real issue was not being able to make money, but the real issue is be able to get money down. Okay. And I'm like, come on, seriously, like that you're that good that all you, that you, all you're, all you're worried about is getting action. And he's like, yeah, pretty much. And, and, and not to say that, not to put the emphasis on that good because of that, but I was I was actually shocked and to, to learn that and, and that there was this whole kind of like sub industry about about getting other people to put in action for you, you know, and and, and I was I was approached by people like, oh, you know, can, do you have an do you have accounts? All, all we want is accounts. I'm looking for all these accounts. I'm like, what do you mean you need these accounts? They, they, they limit me. Like, what do you mean they limit you? They limit sports betters for real, right? And they're like, do you don't understand? You know, we need this account. We need this. We'll give you a 15% free roll. We'll give you 20% this. this. And I, I guess that there was, that that's, that's a, I guess, a huge issue. And then, and so now, I mean, that's all I hear about is being, is, is people being limited, like rules on being limited. And then this kind of, I guess, this huge cat and mouse game of, of, of people trying to get other people to put their bets in and putting sharp action in without the, without the casinos and, book, and bookmakers realizing that it's the sharp action because it's some idiot putting it in instead of, instead of the, uh, instead of the sharp players. Um, it, I mean, are you at, I, I don't want to ask, but are, are, are most people, I'll put it this way. Are most people, is that a big fight? Like, is that really like the, the big fight? Yeah, I can speak to us like uh, a bit on that. That's certainly like I, I would say it's the much more profitable problem to solve. Like that is our biggest problem. Um, I think not that winning's easy, but I think that if you really dedicate yourself to we do a specific sport um, model. I mean, there's three of us working on this problem. Like you, fin you figure out to win, and then it becomes kind of a trivial. Uh, problem and it's not a well-paid problem. The really well-paid problem to solve is how do you get money down, and that's where I think um, you know just people in the industry are you know not gonna not gonna make it and and fall out. It's not because they can't win. There's people that can win and can win against sharp books. And I had a tweet something about like you know the the tail you know the whatever the mid curve tweet and it was like. The left side was like play against 
soft counterparties. The mid, the middle was beat pinnacle for 2%. And then the right side was played against soft, soft counterparties. And the point of the tweet was like beating pinnacle for 2% is hard, but like you're going to be able to do it. And then what do you do from there? Because there's people that beat pinnacle for 2% and own premier league teams. And then there's people who beat pinnacle for 2% and work a W2 that they don't really like and don't make that much money. So the, the, this difference between those two people is getting down. And the one reason that like, uh, you know, the Brentford bees and, you know, BHA are owned by professional gamblers. Those guys, star lizard and, and whatnot get millions and millions and mi- hundreds of millions down at that 2% yeah. edge. And then the people who are kind of like lone wolves and making 40 K a year, but beating pinnacle is they're just kind of getting down nothing. That's, I mean, I got a, I got a funny story about that. I guess it's kind of tying in poker too. I mean, again, I don't want to send too much into stories because again, you, you're, you, you got some very insightful stuff. This is not going to be particularly insightful, but uh, this is a good story about getting money down or whatever. I was approached by someone, this is like a long time ago, maybe 10 years ago about uh, they said that they had this syndicate that they did nothing but prop bets. Um, mm-hmm. and, and this is before prop bets were you know, anywhere. Right. Um, and it was like, all this wild stuff like hockey prop bets, basketball prop bets, whatever. They said they can't get any action down. They have all the illegal bookies. They give them like a certain amount of credit and then eventually they they, they bust them out or whatever and, and whatever. So they said, the guy says, you know, Eric, you know, you, you, you want to give us an account. We'll give you a 10% free roll. You can bet it yourself. I'm like, fine, whatever, just for fun, we'll do it. So I gave, I set up an account on one of their, they were like a, I don't tell you a legal bookie, whatever, but it was, I, I, I found somebody who would take the action. Let's put it that way. Found some guy on two plus two. I say, anybody take sports betting, you know, whatever it is. And someone says, yeah, I got it. I'm, I'm an agent with this, this, this. You can put your bets in online. I'm like, sounds good to me. Right. And he knows sheets. I don't know anything about fucking sports, but he does. So he, he's like, sure, no problem. Right. And it's, I guess it's considered, I guess, bad form, you know, as hustling or whatever. I, I set up the account under my, you know, my name. I didn't tell him where the action was from. And, whatever. So I gave my passwords to these other guys and they started putting stuff in and it was like the greatest sweat in the world. They, they would bet like, like 50 things like every night, like <laughs> hockey goalie props and, you know, one versus the other. I mean, God knows what they were doing, but like every night they seemed to win a little bit. They seemed to win a little bit. They seemed a little bit. And then after a certain period of time, I, I logged on to put something in or for whatever for them. And it said, uh, maximum bet like a dollar. Okay. Yep. So, okay. Right. right. So, uh, so I met the guy, the, the, the poor guy on two plus, so he didn't know, he didn't know any better. Right. So yeah, but he seemed to be a you know smart. Okay. He's been around the block. Like he's been a bookie, you know, he's done whatever. So he, he paid me and he says, yeah, the guys I'm with, um, you know, they don't, they don't, you know, they, they think it was, that's like sharp action. And, uh, you know, they really don't want it. I mean, fair enough. And, of course, I said, what well, I'm like, what do you mean, sharp action? What are you kidding me? <laughs> of course not. Well, I know me. everything about hockey goalies and, and, yeah. and red and white wings. And so, again, so that so we put that aside. About two months later, three months later, the same guy says to me, hey, reach out to the kid and say, say ask you want more action. I'm like, he's not going to. They shut us down, whatever it is. But I figured I would ask. So I reached out to him and I said, hey, listen, you know, it's totally up to you. But if you want to open up the account again, I'm, I'll, I'll, you know, I'm down. He says, you know what? Let's do it. Right. <laughs> he's, he's an aging, right? He's not, didn't really care, I guess that much. He said, I'll check with my guys or whatever. Okay. So same thing happened, of course, just, just ran it up, you know, and then I was supposed to meet the, meet him or get paid and he like didn't show up to get paid. And you're talking about get stiff. Right. And it was, what was it? $8,000 or something like that. You know, not the end of the world, but whatever. I was giving half to this, 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 anyway. Mm. Um, and then, then he had all kinds of excuses, just like back in the eighties when people would have excuses about not being able to pay their vet, their debts. And I got this story. I'm like, dude, what are you talking about? And he's like, yeah, the guys, you know, they haven't paid me yet. The guys, this, the guys, this, and I don't even know why I didn't think of this, but like, boy, it's like such an easy answer that he probably just like kept it all for himself. He never actually like had, had a whatever. And he just, whatever. And, and so he just kept making excuses, kept making excuses. So here's, here's the fun, here's the fun part of the story. So this guy was a pretty prolific poster on two plus two, right? So I was going to out him. I was going to do whatever. And at the time I did, I, re- I reached out to two plus two. And it turns out that this guy had stuff going on with like the whole freaking community, right? Wow. Like, like 
but 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 it went both ways. Like there were guys that owed him that didn't pay this, 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 this. And he was telling everybody that like, I can't pay you until this guy pays me and this whole freaking thing, this whole piece of garbage, right? And and so we're gonna put this all together. Apparently, one of the guys that owed him like a you know a good chunk of the money was Chris Moneymaker. Okay. Chris Moneymaker, he's one of my favorite people on the face of the earth. Like total chill, love the guy. You know, kind of a cool, you know, sweet degenerate like a lot of us are, you know, mm-hmm. and and so sweet. And he went on to, yeah, dude, I totally owe you money, but I'm hearing you're stiffing everybody. Why am I paying you? You know what I mean? Like, no, no, everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this whole thing, right? And so, and of course, the normal arguments. Well, what does me owing people have to do with you paying? And then this, and this is all going on in two plus two. And I'm sitting here, I'm owed eight thousand, and and what's his name, uh, Chris? I think he owed him the same amount. So I reached out to Chris, and this is awesome. I said to him, I said, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I said, I'm going to forgive the 8000 that I that they owe me, okay? And you don't even have to pay me the eight. What you have to do for me, I run a, uh, I, I'm part of a poker charity tournament. I run once a year. Uh, I'm actually, it's not even mine, but I'm like kind of a sponsor of it, where we, we raise money for kidney disease. A really good friend of mine has a poor kid who, who's died, who had terrible kidney issues. And we run a tournament every year with like 200 people. And I said, I'll tell you what, if you come out to New York, okay, and play in the tournament and be like an ambassador and serve as like a bounty or whatever, that'll totally forgive the whole thing. It's like totally done. So Chris flew out from Nashville. I picked him up at the, at the airport and he came and he was the nicest guy on the face of the earth. And we raised like hundreds of thousands. Wow. <laughs> yep, because he came. So, so that that's like a combination of not getting money down because of the thing, plus having the 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 wherewithal to knowing how to solve like emotional yeah. issues. And I would have paid twenty thousand for him to come, you know. And he probably would have done it for free, you know. Yeah. So it all it all worked. It out. all won. Yeah, everybody a good deal. Both sides walk away. Yeah, like, and the guy never paid me. He's a complete piece of garbage, and I'm not. I'm yeah, not that sounds right. And I, I think a few like. On when we recorded this the first, the first time, we said, I think you said something. It was like when people are like, "No, you have to out that person to protect the community." Oh. I agree with you here. It's only because people want drama. Yeah, exactly. exactly. That's it. Those people are not like white knight. The whole like got to protect the community yeah. crowd is just the biggest like drama queens. And yeah. look, I mean. You know, not that it's an absolutely invalid argument, but like those people aren't there trying to protect the community. Yeah, no, <laughs> absolutely not. Um, the other thing I wanted to update you on also is a- another thing that we talked about last time was this idea of content with with respect to sports betting. Okay, because mm-hmm. um, that's the thing I think about now is sports is content. And you remember when I did poker, I had Poker X Factor, and that was that was content. What we did was we did videos where I taught people how to play. And then there was this live sweat where people would, would watch me like 20 table. Okay. This is before Twitch even existed. Okay. Wow. Um, literally before it existed, there was no d- delay. People that were watching me could probably see <laughs> yeah, like the cards they were playing against. Snipe you, walking. stream you know? snipe you. It was awesome, right? And anyway, so, so, and that was a lot of fun. And then even in DFS, I try to think of good ways to have content, like whether it be, you know, doing like uh, who to, who to play today or how to use the Sims or, or just actually live sweating the lineups. So I always think about that. And then I think about whether sports betting, is there a place for content? Yeah, okay, you could give your picks, whatever. That, that, I don't consider that content. There, there are, you can certainly do what you do. I guess you and people, some people like you do is actually try to teach people how to win, okay? In some form, whether it be providing them tools, whether it be just lecturing them or in some way or whatever. And that that's that's content too. That's really good. But what I always was wondering was whether you could turn it into something entertaining, you know, like like a sweat of some kind, right? Where 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 there's a place for that in sports betting. And the example I used that was really strange, and we talked about this last time too, is through a weird coincidence, I got turned on to this podcast that that guy Elf was running. Okay. Elf, so, my right? guy, yeah. So, so this guy Elf was was I don't, this guy PV Analytics was in some freaking Twitter beef with him or something. He said, I got to go to this 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 thing and like kind of arguing about some stupid shit. And I'm like, I've never heard of this. So he's like, yeah, it's being uh, broadcast on Kick. I'm like, what the hell is Kick? 
And like I kick his like for for Twitch for like cool kids, I guess. I don't know. So so I went and I, I figured out how to download Kick for openers. And then I went to this guy's site, and it was amazing what he was doing. And you know, he was he had it. He was like a, he's an account by day, but at night he like puts on his hoodie, he does his thing, yeah. and he streams live our betting. Okay, uh, like twenty tabling, right? Right from poker, right? So twenty mm-hmm. screening live our betting where he's trying to make a penny here and there, whatever it is. And they're like people watching. I'm like, wait a minute, for real? And there were people like 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 commenting and this, that, and the other thing. And I walked in there and some people saw my my username, Sheets, like, hey, I'm like, what's up? I'm like, wait, is this actually Sheets from poker? I'm like, yeah. And the elf guy's like, well, who's Sheets? And next thing you know, they're like, oh, you gotta get him on. So he took me on a show like immediately. And we had like a you know interesting discussion about whatever. So so I'm thinking, well, is there actually I mean, there's no way that this thing can actually be popular, but but there there's probably a niche for that. And I just always wonder, like, if, if 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 people are interested in like, in like some kind of sports betting sweat, I guess I I, I don't know. Uh, that that's the closest thing that I kind of came up with. Um, but I guess it's just I don't know. Like, I, I, you're you're pretty content, I suppose, with um, with what with what you're doing. But do you think that there's anything that could be a little more entertaining for considering that sports betting is legal, um, aside from just you know touting? Yeah, I mean, I've dipped my toes into uh, some more. I, you know, I, I, I got flamed for a pretty, uh, what I felt was like a TikToky type video. I've thought, I look, I don't think there's, I, I like what Elf does because like he kind of has solved the problem better than anyone else. Like whatever you think about Elf and like odd jam referrals or whatever, it's not really the point. Like the point is that. I don't think I've seen anybody get that many people on a stream for sports yeah. betting. For poker, yeah. yes, but like, like you said, like uh, as you, far you as I know, to, yeah, you have to pause this for just a second. I apologize. Okay. Anyway, slight break. Uh, talking about Elf, though, like what what I think about Elf is that what, like you said, I think he solved that problem better than anyone. I think it's like an impossible problem to solve. I think there's some version of some like live, like micro betting PVP stuff you could do. Like imagine like a like a Calcutta of like baseball players coming up in the next inning or something. And then you like buy them with other people on a stream. Uh, Something like that uh, could maybe work. I've always thought about this. I want to do something that's educational and like not, no, sorry. I, I don't, everything I do right now is mainly educational. I like doing that. I'm okay with doing something that isn't educational, but it can't be like, anti-educational feed people to sports books like to to share like the joy like what i saw from poker like i loved watching phil ivy i think a lot a big reason of the reason i'm a professional gambler is partly because i thought phil ivy was so cool when i was 18 but like and i watched him and it wasn't anti-educational content it was him battling on high stakes poker more of that sounds awesome um it doesn't have to be like a lecture about you know, non-standard distributions and like how that affects, you know, median versus mean pricing. Yeah. Not everything has to be that. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. Like I think PVP or sorry, like, uh, you know, player, you know, gambler versus gambler, not gambler versus house stuff could work if it's like, if the results are within the 10 minutes. So it's like you place the bet, you play each other, whatever you, you do your little mini Calcutta of, you know, golfers coming up on the next hole. And then you watch them play the whole, and then you rinse, rinse and repeat the next stream or something. Like there could be something there, but the feedback loop has to be tightened a ton because in sports betting, it's like you bet, and then like nine hours later, your bet gets graded, and that's I, just like not interesting. So I have a question. So I, I have a call in about fifteen minutes with with that has to do with this. Um, so I yeah, can't really get into too much of the details, but I'm gonna pose it to you in another way. Um. You familiar with the Circa Millions uh, contest? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. So Circa, Circa has a Survivor, big Survivor contest, and a big Circa Millions contest where you compete by picking against the spread. Okay, and big, big prizes for first. Um, wh- what would you do? You think there'd be interest in in if Circa? I mean, they'd probably do some of this. Like if Circa did like a weekly show, right? Where 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 they they really covered the uh, this is going to be a bad example 
like, like the contest and they would like interview people and like they would interview the leaders and, and people would, you know, I don't know, like start to root for people that are in the contest or something like that. Cause I'm trying to, trying to think about it in terms of world series of poker, you know, like people are, are, and, and people say like at the top of the list, like who, who does this person have in the, in, in the circa millions? Well, let's see, let's, let's, let's have a show where we see how those, those teams are doing or something like that. Um, so I'm, I'm involved in discussions with about actually a show and it's not exactly that, but, but, but it's something like that. But do you think that, again, this is not going to be particularly educational. It's completely entertainment, right? Right. But, but, but do you think that that people get, would get behind that? I mean, like would people find just like a reality show, like are people find people to root for in big brother, people find people to root for in, in, in the survivor show. Like would people find like guys to root for in circa millions or something like that? So you've touched on like kind of something I always think about, which is Survivor, Big Brother, Brother, Traders, all these games that are actually very complex games that do well on TV. And I think would be interesting to do some gamification version of uh, the decision-making around gambling. I don't know how it would work, but like I think Traders is a a good show that kind of does it decently. The Circa thing, I think it would work well. And I think this Sh- Sean Perry's uh, presence in Circa uh, final like seven last year kind of blew the contest up. And I was joking with Mr. Limited. I was like, there's the moneymaker effect. Will there be the Sean Perry effect of like well, the Circa it's not, millions? Not even the Sean Perry effect also, but but the, uh, the the real the real driver, and that's just that's the survivor pool stuff. Right, right. I'm right. About the stuff. Okay. But the, the the other guy, that guy who's like all over the internet now, uh, George, uh, whatever his name is, George. Oh, GRP wins. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's like he's like a legend now. I mean, he's like the ultimate moneymaker effect. I mean, he's he's he and the back and forth between him and Benson is is, oh is legendary. You know, um, I really hope he wins. You know that that. Oh that, my that, god! That's right. Bad. I mean, uh, well, we certainly would hear about it for a while. Yeah, sure would. Um, yeah, I I I'm. These are things I think about a ton because I think like, what am I going to do after betting? Like right now I'm not at my, I've not like reached peak liquidity where this is now a problem where I need to go find something else to do. I like doing it and it's still my best hourly, but like, you know, a big reason I like to do this is I, I kind of, I like content. I like watching things that are interesting. I loved watching poker after dark. I loved watching high stakes poker. Um, I like the space. So like, I think there's something there. Like it's succeeded in the past with poker. There's not, there's, you can't tell me there's no way for it to succeed somewhere else besides poker, in my opinion. But um, yeah, it could be a totally new game where you have like, it could be, you know, it could be, it could be like the AP World Series, right? And you got like some blackjack players, some poker players, some sports yeah, players. That's all, they're, 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 those ideas have already been, always been thrown around. Like, like yeah. Like, backgammon plus poker, like backgammon plus poker plus chess, like the world series of games or something like that. Um, and then you, yeah, make, yeah. That, you make that gambling, you know, about, uh, you know, you have, have a certain bankroll to play in sports betting or versus DFS versus, versus horse racing, you know, or something like that. Yeah. That's, there's a uh, definitely like logistically complicated, but you could even pile them all together and create some kind of like social game, like survivor, but not yeah. as physically strenuous, you know, like yeah. one of the saddest things for poker was when Garrett got knocked out first episode on survivor with like his, he had the idol or whatever. And it's like the poker player can't even survive like in the nut spot on this game. Like maybe there's something, uh, something there. Well, Vanessa did a nice job on Big Brother, though. Vanessa Russo. Yes, she, uh, yes. She did a nice job on Big Brother. Yeah, I think those, I, I don't know, but I'm 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 intrigued. I'd love to hear what you know this see this uh these ideas are com- coming down the line. But I'm this right, is something I'm gonna, I'm gonna I want to see. I'm gonna tell you literally after this phone call, I might reach back out to you and talk to you more. Okay. Um, well, I know we're we're bumping up on time sheets, like. Uh, could go another two hours, I'm sure. Uh, we'll have you back on. Uh, Absolutely, we'll have you back on. But thank you well, again let's, so let's much. Make sure, let's make sure this. Let's make sure this one saves first. Okay, so we're gonna pause. We're gonna yeah, we're gonna do the thing where we wait on the call or whatever okay. for the five minutes for shout okay. out Zencaster, um, and then yeah, if not, we'll film a third. Thanks for coming on, man. All right, thanks.